Megan looked at Isabella and asked, What do you want? Hand Taylor over and I'll let the both of you go, Isabella smirked. Isabella knew she could pressure them because she had brought enough people with her. And what if I don't? Not only was Megan not planning to cooperate, she even pulled Taylor back. Then don't blame me for what happens after that. Isabella waved her hand, signaling her bodyguards to snatch Taylor away from Megan. It was then that Megan's guards sprang out from behind and formed a wall in between them. Isabella did not expect Megan to have brought more guards than she had and realized that she couldn't snatch Taylor away by force. Let's go, Megan said, noticing that Isabella was stunned. They returned to the beach, where everything was already set up. They laid down on the beach chairs to calm themselves down. Thank you again, Taylor said to Megan when she thought of Isabella's stunned expression. I don't even know how to repay you. If Taylor were alone in the shop, she would have been dragged away by force. While the ladies were talking, Connor and Harvey returned with the kids. When they saw another unfamiliar face with their wives, the husbands looked at them curiously. Hubby, this is my friend from school. The one that I told you about before, Taylor. Megan quickly introduced her. I saw her at the market we were at and invited her to join us. Miss Taylor, nice to meet you, Connor greeted. Nice to meet you too, Mr. Wilson. Taylor greeted back excitedly as she finally got to meet her idol. When she had visited the manor last time, Connor was still unconscious. Seeing Connor up and well was a relief for Taylor. Megan then introduced Taylor to Harvey and his family. Barbecues and healthy foods were prepared for lunch. Since Connor was there, Megan could only hold back her urges to eat some barbecued foods. She knew that Connor would never let her touch anything that was unhealthy. It was a delightful lunch as Taylor looked at the two happy families and couldn't help but feel a little jealous. She couldn't help but think about the baby she once had with Ashton and wondered how her life would be if the baby were still alive. They took a rest after lunch before deciding on what to do for afternoon activities. A movie set was up near them. It was also lunchtime for the crew and stars. Isabella laid on her comfortable chair as the makeup artist was putting her makeup on. Did you find out where they went? Isabella asked her assistant. Yes, it seems like they're having a picnic just next to us, and they have a lot of people with them. Isabella knew that they were not alone. According to the number of bodyguards they had just now, she assumed that Megan must be well protected. Therefore, she had to think of a different approach. After a while... Isabella made up her mind and whispered to her assistant, Got it? Yes. The assistant took her order and left the crew instantly. After lunch, the kids were playing, and the two dads were doing their best to keep the kids busy so that the wives could take some good rest and chat. The three women had done their shopping in the morning and were now lying on the lounges and chatting. Megan was curious. Taylor, how have you been lately? Did that Mr. Ashton come for you again? Speaking of Ashton, Taylor felt awkward. Well, why should he come for me? I have nothing to do with him. Don't lie to me. He surely likes you. Why not try to hang out with him? That's impossible. Let's not talk about him. I'm not having anything to do with him ever again. Taylor didn't want to talk about him or getting back to him at all. As an outsider, Megan could tell that Ashton liked Taylor very much, but Taylor was not giving him a chance. Although she'd only gotten to know Taylor for a short while, she could always sense her sadness and worry. She must have suffered a lot and didn't want it to be exposed. No matter what it was, Megan did hope that Taylor could find her true love. Jenna had been quiet until now. Actually, you never know. Like me and my husband, we used to say we would never see each other again, but eventually we came back to each other. Upon hearing her words, Megan asked, Sister, you never mentioned your love story. Why not tell us now? When women hung out, their topics were always family, children, and love. Since Megan had asked, Jenna told them of her story. As Jenna had mentioned, she and Abe used to be a quarrelsome couple. They got married and divorced. They had a child but lost him in a miscarriage. Her gynecological problem was also a result of that miscarriage. If Abe had not made some thorough changes and given up his family career to come to New York with Jenna, then they would have never gone back together and there would have never been a Patrick. 
Hearing her story, the other two women got sentimental. Sister, I never knew you went through all of that. I thought you and Harvey had always been a happy couple. Jenna smiled. There's no easy happiness. The happy people you see have gone through a lot and worked hard to get there. You are right. They were contemplating while a group of girls and boys came along the beach with surfboards. When they passed the three women, a man suddenly ran out of the group and darted to them. Taylor sensed the danger first. When she saw him coming with a knife, she instinctively covered Megan with her own body. Megan, be careful, Taylor shouted as the blade dug into her back. Jenna shouted for help as she pushed the attacker away. But unluckily for Jenna, the attacker still managed to cut her arm. When the attacker tried to attack again, the guards surrounded him and apprehended him. The attacker tried to resist until one of the guards snapped his neck. The two men that were with the kids quickly ran to their wives. When they heard their pleas for help, the kids followed them too. Megan? Jenna? Mommy? Taylor was lying on top of Megan as blood soaked her clothes. Abby, hurry up and save Taylor. Megan was still in shock. She couldn't react when she noticed the attacker was holding a knife, and it was Taylor's quick reaction that had saved her and taken the hit for her. Connor helped Taylor up and rested her on a nearby chair. After making sure that Megan wasn't hurt, Connor let out a sigh of relief. He also ordered his guards to take Taylor to a nearby hospital. Jenna is hurt too. I can go to the hospital with them. You stay here and take care of the kids, Harvey said, and left with the guards. Mommy, are you all right? Alice asked worriedly, as she couldn't ignore the blood on Megan's clothes. Mommy's fine, but Auntie Taylor is not, Megan said. She risked her life to save me, and so did Auntie Jenna. Can I go look for my mother? Patrick asked. Yes, we'll go there together after this, okay? Connor went to check on the attacker and realized he was already dead. Go and find out who sent him, Connor ordered. Yes, sir. Connor wanted to know who had the nerve to send an attacker to target his wife in broad daylight. He had to find out. This place is not safe anymore. We have to leave, Connor said as he helped Megan up. After what had happened, Connor believed that he would never revisit Likey, as that place brought nothing but bad memories. Harris was attacked when they last visited, and now the ladies were attacked. Connor quickly took his wife and the kids to the hospital. Harvey was with his wife, whose hand was bandaged. Since Taylor was still in the ER, they could only wait at the hospital. Taylor's phone, which Megan was holding on to, rang while they were waiting. Since Megan was worried that it might be Taylor's family, she decided to answer it. But when she saw the caller ID, she could guess who was calling Taylor. Hello? Megan answered. How long do I have to wait for you to pick the phone up? The man on the other side of the phone asked with a cold voice. Mr. Ashton, I assume? I'm Taylor's friend. My name is Megan. Ashton asked where Taylor was, and Megan answered truthfully. When the man heard about Taylor's condition, Megan could clearly hear him panicking. Ashton asked for the hospital's location, and Megan told him. He thanked Megan and hung up. She had no idea if it was right to tell him about Taylor's situation, but Megan felt that it might be a good chance for the two of them. After emergency surgery, Taylor was out of danger, but her lung had been pierced and she had to stay in the hospital for a while longer. Connor arranged the best ward for her and booked the presidential suite at a five-star hotel nearby for themselves and Abe and his family. They would wait for Taylor to wake up. Their guards came back and reported that the assassin was actually a crazy homeless person. He had no place to live and always wandered around the town. No one knew why he went after the women yesterday. Since the homeless man was dead now, they could no longer ask for further details and had to stop investigating. Taylor woke up the following morning. She had been stabbed in the back, so she could only lie on her stomach. Megan came with her husband to visit Taylor. Taylor, thank you so much. It would have been me if it was not for you. Taylor seemed a bit pale and weak. 
Never mind. It's good you and the babies are fine. After a short while, someone rushed in and seemed to have traveled a long way. Ashton rushed into the room and was still panting. When seeing the side of the woman lying on the bed, he confirmed that it was indeed Taylor. Megan had told him over the phone yesterday that Taylor was hurt. He could not help but be extremely worried and flew immediately from New York to California. Seeing Taylor like this, he felt his heart being gripped. But since there were other people here, he tried to hide his worries. Megan saw him and greeted him. Mr. Ashton, that was quick. Him. Ashton nodded at her and then recognized Connor. Mr. Wilson, what a pleasure. Likewise, Mr. Ashton. Connor knew Ashton too. They had met briefly in a conference a while ago and knew that he was the key person for Southern New York's economy and a touch figure. Hearing Ashton's voice, Taylor was surprised and upset. She tried to move, but the wound on her back hurt sharply. Ouch. Hearing that, Ashton ran to her and asked, Taylor, how do you feel now? Instead of answering, Taylor turned away from him. Ashton was used to her reacting like this and had asked Megan for help. What happened? Who did this? A crazy homeless guy. He's already been taken down, Connor said briefly. It seemed to be merely an accident. Ashton talked with Connor and his wife for a while longer and concluded, Thank you so much for taking care of her. Taylor was hurt saving my life. We definitely have to take care of her, Megan said. Well, if you have other important matters to attend to, you can leave her with me now. Ashton took the responsibility as if it was his bound duty. That's good. We will be relieved with you taking care of Taylor. Then off we go. They did have to rush back to Lynchy for the matching results now. Taylor, just take some rest, Megan said. Have Mr. Ashton take you back to the city. I'll ask for a leave of absence for you from school. Megan, Taylor didn't want Ashton to take care of her, but she didn't want to trouble Megan either. It felt like she was walking straight into Ashton's arm. Mr. Wilson, Mrs. Wilson, let me escort you out, Ashton offered as he led them to the door and handed them his name card. If any of you were to visit the city, be sure to let me know. Thank you. Please take good care of Taylor, Megan said before leaving. I will. After the couple had left, Ashton went back into the room. Taylor was pretending to be asleep. Ashton let out a sigh and walked to her side to check on her. Ashton had heard that Taylor was stabbed in the back and decided to pull her shirt up to check. Ashton, don't you dare touch me, Taylor scolded the second she felt Ashton pulling on her shirt. I just want to check. You can't look. What are you afraid of? I've already seen every part of you anyway. The man continued to pull Taylor's shirt up and noticed the bandages covering her wound. He couldn't help but feel pained from seeing it. It was a waste to ruin such a beautiful back, Ashton thought. Are you done? Can you stop staring at me now? Fine. Ashton helped pull her shirt back down. From now on, I'll take care of you, Ashton whispered with a gentle voice as he tucked her hair behind her ears. Taylor rolled her eyes. Even if she didn't want to, she had no other choice. The couple came out from the hospital and went back to the city with Harvey and his family. I am sorry for ruining the day. It was supposed to be a pleasant trip. You even got hurt. Megan apologized to Jenna on their way back. It's okay. It's just a cut. It'll heal in no time. What's most important is that you are okay. Jenna smiled. She didn't mind it since it was an accident. But when Jenna thought of what had happened, she couldn't help but feel a chill down her spine. Megan had been lying on the beach chair when the man attacked. There was no way Megan could have escaped in time. If the knife were to hurt Megan's belly, anything could have happened to the babies. Megan was lucky that Taylor and Jenna were there to protect her. After going back to the city, Megan asked Harvey and Jenna to stay at the manor while they were still in California. While the kids stayed at the manor, Megan accompanied her husband to the hospital. More than a thousand people had volunteered to check if they could be a donor. It showed how loved Connor was by his friends and subordinates.
In the end, there was only one person who was compatible with Connor, and that was Connor's brother, Trevor. It was nothing unexpected. When Rowan suggested that they should try looking for a match in the immediate family, Megan felt that it might be Trevor. Now, it turned out that he was indeed the one. This is great, honey. We finally found the match. You'll be fine. Megan was so excited and cuddled her husband, but Connor didn't feel so good. Knowing that he would have the bone mass of the person he hated the most transplanted into his own body, it felt complicated. How he wished he could say no to it. After finding the match, they would need to set a time for the operation. Megan asked Rowan, Dr. Rowan, when shall we schedule the operation? You need to take that person to the hospital for a thorough check. When it's ready, I'll let you know. Sure, sure. Coming back home, Megan went to Penny to tell her the result. Penny was also excited and kept praying, Thank God, Connor will be fine now. But Megan was worried. What if Trevor did not want to donate his bone mass? Penny had decided for him to take his blood sample for the matching, but now she had to tell him in person about the matter. Megan asked Penny to wait outside while she tried to talk to Trevor face to face. She felt very calm. There was no point recalling whatever happened in the past, so she went straight forward. Trevor, although you act like I'm an idiot, I know you're not completely insane. You are from time to time sober, aren't you? If you happen to be somewhat sober now, I'm telling you something. We've gotten the results and your bone mass matches perfectly with Connor's. The doctor asked that you have a thorough check tomorrow so that we can schedule the operation. I'm telling you this because I respect you as a human being. I hope to get your consent on this. If by any chance you can understand my words and agree to donate your bone marrow, can you please press your finger on mine? After saying that, Megan pointed a finger towards Trevor. She waited for a long while until the crazy Trevor stopped and looked at her finger. Then he pointed his own and pressed it on hers. After that, he continued playing with his toys. Upon getting his consent, Megan stood up and headed off. But before she stepped out of the room, Megan turned back to him and asked, Trevor, was that you who saved me in the amusement park? She was merely doubting if it could be Trevor, since when did she have this doubt? Perhaps it was since the moment he saved Alice. He had acted so swiftly and seemed nothing like an idiot. But Trevor gave no reaction. He kept sitting on the floor and seemed to not hear her at all. He was indeed an idiot now. How could that be him? Megan sighed and left. On the following day, they took Trevor to the hospital. The result was good. Trevor was in perfect condition for the operation. They scheduled it for 8 o'clock, two days from then. During these two days, Megan asked Connor to stay away from his business and rest at home to get ready for the operation. Trevor also got the same treatment as they wanted him to be at his best for the surgery. Megan took a leave of absence from school and went to the hospital with her husband two days later. They had also sent someone to pick Penny and Trevor up. All three of Connor's sisters were also present at the hospital. Even though they weren't related by blood, their relationship was already well past that. Since Susan and Layla were in the city, it wasn't much of a bother to them. Jesse came from New York and Xavier went to the airport to fetch her. The sisters met with Connor at the hospital. They chatted until the nurse told them it was time for the surgery. Megan, Connor opened his mouth as he held Megan's hands as if he had something to tell her. The sisters decided to leave, giving the couple some alone time. Don't worry, you'll be fine. The doctor said there's not much risk with the procedure. Megan comforted him, but the truth was that she was the one who was worried the most. I know, it'll be fine. Connor knew that Megan was trying to be brave, but her hands were shaking. It's almost time. I'll be waiting for you outside the surgery theater. Thank you. I hope the first person I get to see after the surgery is you. Connor hugged his wife and kissed her. A knock came from the door and a nurse came in telling Connor to enter the operation room. Then I'll be going now, Connor said with his sexy voice. He let Megan go and gently brushed his fingers across her cheek. Okay. Megan accompanied him until she could not proceed forward anymore. Connor walked through the door and it closed behind him. The moment Megan lost sight of Connor, she began to worry. Trevor was also brought into the room. The operation began. 
While only hours had passed, it felt like days for the people waiting outside. The doctor finally came out of the room. Megan and other people ran up to him and asked him about the surgery. Don't worry, Mrs. Wilson. The surgery was a huge success, the doctor said as he took his mask off. Megan and other people finally let out sighs of relief. Connor and Trevor were pushed back into their respective rooms. They still needed to stay at the hospital for a few more days. Connor woke up from the anesthetic. He realized he was still in the hospital. He turned his head and saw his wife with her head down. Megan sat quietly next to him and she was knitting a sweater. The sweater was almost done and it was starting to take shape. She would check a few details of the sweater from time to time. She would also set her hands on her belly when she felt the babies kicking her. It was such a pretty scene that Connor did not want to break the silence. He could not turn his eyes away from her and kept looking carefully at her every single movement and expression. After quite a while, Megan felt a bit exhausted with knitting and raised her head to relax her neck. Then she realized that she was already awake. Honey, you're awake. Megan was very surprised. The doctor said it might be a while longer, but it had only taken him a couple of hours. Yeah, sorry, honey, to make you worry again. Connor reached out to her, and Megan got a hold of his hand and pressed it to her cheek. Don't say that. It's already a huge comfort that you woke up so quickly. Yeah. Connor pulled her closer and pressed his forehead to hers. He smelled a faint scent from her and felt like kissing her. Just before their lips were about to touch, a little one called, Daddy? They had a bounce back. Connor looked towards the door and saw two little figures darting in. Alice came in first, followed by Patrick and his parents. Alice was also very excited to see her father awake. She ran to him and took his hand in hers and then asked, Daddy, how are you feeling now? Does it hurt? Not at all. Daddy, you have no idea how worried I am about you. I could barely eat anything. Only three buns. <laughs> you call three buns nothing? Connor petted her on the head and replied seriously. Indeed, I can tell that. You are so skinny now. Alice played cute and stayed as close as she could to her father. Abe and his wife came to check on Connor and told them that he would be leaving on the following day. There were too many things for him to take care of back in New York, so they couldn't stay too long in California. Patrick was at least willing to go, but he could do nothing about it. How reluctant he was to part with his little wife again. Jenna tried hard to convince him, and he only agreed to go home on the condition that she would bring him to California again when she came for a follow-up check next time. Sorry, I cannot send you to the airport tomorrow, Connor said. Never mind. You stay well. When we come back again, I guess it'll be time for Megan to give birth. Let's celebrate then. Right, I will send you an invitation and you cannot miss it. Connor would not wait to share the news with all his friends that they would have two newborns soon. They agreed that they would invite all their friends from New York to celebrate the birth of the babies. Considering that Connor would need more rest after the operation, Abe did not stay long and took the two children to leave shortly after. Hearing that he was already awake, the family came to visit Connor in the afternoon. Jesse came accompanied by Xavier. Connor was a bit surprised to see Jesse. Elder sister, I didn't know you were coming. Jesse came to him, greeted Megan and said, How could you hide this from me? Luckily, Megan told me so that I could come in time. She tucked her brother in and asked, How do you feel now? I'm better, don't worry, Jesse replied. Where's Pete? Is he not here with you? Connor was already missing his niece. No, he still has to go to school. I see. We'll bring him over during the holidays. Alice misses her big brother. I will, Jesse nodded. Connor looked at Xavier standing behind Jesse. Uncle-in-law is here too? Yep, I'm here to accompany Jesse, Xavier said. Thank you. Why don't you take my sister around? It's her first time in California. The truth was, Connor wanted to ask Xavier how it went with Jesse, but there was no way he could ask the question with Jesse around. Will do. Xavier would never let such a chance slip by. They stayed for a little longer and left after that, thinking that it would be best for Connor to rest after the surgery. Then we'll take our leave now. Leave your sister to me, I'll take care of her, Xavier said. 
Being one of his trusted aides, Xavier had earned Connor's trust. Connor wouldn't mind leaving his sister in Xavier's hands. I'll go see them off, Megan said and got up. No, stay. You should take care of yourself too, Xavier said. Xavier took the chance and grabbed Jesse's hand before leaving the room, but once they were out, Jesse pulled her hand back. What's wrong? Xavier asked. Nothing. Come on, I'll bring you to some of the best spots in the city. Xavier opened the door to his car. Jesse didn't really want to go. She wanted to talk to Xavier about something, but didn't have the chance to do so. In the end, she got into his car. Xavier was really excited as he drove to the destination. If not for Connor's surgery, Xavier wondered how long he would have to wait before he could see Jesse. Now that Jesse was in California without her son, he finally got some alone time with her. He planned to propose to her romantically to win her heart. Xavier took Jesse around the city during the day. When night fell, Xavier took Jesse to the most prosperous part of the city, the city square. A skyscraper stood beside the square with a huge LED screen on it. Christmas was near, and a huge Christmas tree was set up in the middle of the square. Xavier had Jesse wait under the tree as he went to buy something. Jesse waited patiently, but Xavier did not return. Just as she was about to call him, she suddenly heard people gasping around her. Look at that. Is someone confessing? No, isn't that a proposal? Jesse raised her head and saw the contents of the screen on the skyscraper had been changed to lines of words. Jesse, I love you. Will you marry me and let me take care of you for the rest of my life? Jesse looked at the screen and couldn't hide her surprise. Who's proposing, Jesse thought. It's so romantic. Is the lucky lady called Jesse too? Jessie never thought it could be for her. She assumed that the girl being proposed to must happen to have the same character as her. Right then, she heard some girls screaming. When she turned back, she saw someone coming towards her with a huge bouquet of scarlet roses. The huge bouquet completely blocked her sight. When the man stopped in front of her, he lowered the roses and unveiled his face. Savior? Yes, it's me, Jessie. While he stood right in front of her, a girl of people showed up from nowhere. Each of them was holding two candles and walked closer and closer towards them. Eventually, they placed the candles around them and formed a heart-shaped candle lit circle. The proposal had officially started. Jesse was stunned. His proposal had caught her completely unprepared. Jesse, please forgive me for proposing to you abruptly under such a circumstance. But the only thing I can say is, this is what I've always wanted to do. I've been waiting for this moment for so long. Jesse, I have no idea what you are thinking about, but I have to tell you what I am. I hope I can be with you every single day from now on. When you are happy, I want you to be happier. When you feel sad, I will wipe your tears. If you are tired, you can always rest on my shoulders. I hope I can be your shelter and your sky. Therefore, I'm saying wholeheartedly, I love you, Jesse. Will you marry me? Will you give me the honor to take care of you for the rest of our lives? Xavier was no longer young, but he had tried his best to make a romantic proposal. He felt extremely nervous and waited anxiously for her reply. People were pouring into the square to witness this. Some were saying how romantic he was and others were urging Jesse to say, yes, I do. Jesse was completely overwhelmed. But she managed to think it through and finally gave him a serious answer. I'm sorry, Xavier. I know you are good to me, but I'm sorry. I cannot marry you. Please don't waste your time on me and go find a better girl for yourself. Upon saying so, she turned and ran into the crowd, leaving Xavier alone. A romantic proposal had been turned into a joke. There were people laughing at his failure. Xavier stood there looking at her disappearing figure and feeling desperate. He knew that he would never win her back. The ring he had prepared was of no use now. Then his men came to remove the candles. The girl walked to him and patted him gently on the shoulder. Boss, are you okay? Xavier turned and saw the girl Madison. She was the newly appointed commander of JS First Squadron, replacing Toby. They had known each other for a long while and fought several fierce battles together. Seeing that Madison was concerned for him, Xavier smiled awkwardly. Never mind. How stupid I am. 
Then he gave the roses to Madison and said, Thank you. Take your men back. I need to be alone now. Xavier left, seeing him being lonely and desperate. Madison felt a sudden punch on her heart. How come she felt somewhat heartbroken for him? Madison sighed as she looked at the screen and roses in her hand. The first thing she did as soon as she was transferred to JS1 was to help her boss propose, but it failed in the end. Such a waste, she thought. Even though Xavier's words did not reach Jesse's heart, they did move Madison. She could feel how much Xavier really loved the woman he was proposing to and could not understand why that woman would not accept him. The proposal was ended swiftly, and Jesse left on the third day after Connor was stable. When Connor and Megan heard about their proposal from Woody, both of them felt that Xavier might not be able to get Jesse back again. Such a waste. Uncle has been waiting for her for such a long time, and it had to end like this, Megan sighed. It might not be a bad thing. With this, he might be able to start a new life and meet the one he was meant to be with, Connor said. You're right. With Trevor's stem cells and a decent amount of rest, Connor was able to recover smoothly. After staying in the hospital for a few days, he was clear to leave. You can go back now. Rowan relayed the good news. Make sure not to strain yourself. You still have another surgery in 20 days. 20 days meant that the surgery would be scheduled for Christmas. And the day before Christmas was Megan's birthday. The only thing Megan wanted for her birthday was for her husband's surgery to go smoothly. Connor left the hospital and rested at home, leaving all his work to Woody. Since Woody became busier than before, he rarely went back home and couldn't meet Layla as much as he used to. On the other hand, Layla was happy about it. She had finally gained her freedom. She really hoped that Woody could become busier so that he wouldn't be a bother to her. There was more good news. Taylor had recovered and was going back to class again. After a while, Harvey and his family came to California again. After Jenna's first session with Richard, she could feel herself getting better. Her uterus had finally stopped bleeding. That was why they had revisited California, so they could completely cure her illness. Time flew, and it was Christmas Eve. Connor prepared an unforgettable birthday surprise for Megan. He booked one of the best three-star restaurants in the city for a romantic dinner. Even though it was so cold that it might snow that night, the decorations in the restaurant were enough to melt Megan's heart. But they could not feel the coldness at all on the terrace. Instead, they even saw a starry midsummer night. Megan was surprised to see the stars in the sky and said, Wow, this is unbelievable. How did you do it? As long as I want, there's nothing I cannot do. Connor did not tell her the details. It was enveloped with an artificial sky. It looked real, but it could change into different times and seasons as he wanted. Therefore, the people throughout witnessed this marvelous midsummer starry night and the chilling winter. Soon enough, the waiter served a candlelit dinner and charming melodies were played. Connor bowed to invite her for a dance. It's old school, but I do want to take this beautiful lady for a dance. Who said it's old school? I couldn't be happier. Megan placed her hand in Connor's and started dancing with him. They danced for a while and then she said, Honey, I appreciate whatever you did, but you should have not taken the trouble to celebrate my birthday. You're having the surgery tomorrow and I want you to get good rest. Megan knew that he must have planned so hard for this, but he was suffering from the clot in his brain and she did not want him to be worn out. It's not troublesome at all. I couldn't be more happy to do this for you. When you are happy, I'm even happier. I have no ambitions now. My only hope is to stay with you every single day from now on and to watch every sunrise together as well as every folding and unfolding of the clouds. When he said so, the sky transformed into daybreak with the rosy color of dawn all over. It had suddenly changed into a bright day. Everyone was impressed with such a marvelous scene. After the daylight, the night fell again, and light spots appeared around them. This is amazing. Are those fireflies? They are, but not real. They were all special visual effects. The countless dancing fireflies added to the romance. They finished a perfect dance on a wonderful night. Then Connor escorted her to her seat for the candlelit dinner. In the end, the waiter delivered a heart-shaped birthday cake made by Connor. 
he lit two heart-shaped candles and asked Megan to make a wish. Megan closed her eyes in front of the flickering candlelight and made her wish. Her wish was very simple. She wanted his surgery tomorrow to be a success. When the candles were blown out, Connor cut a small slice from the cake and asked her to try it. When Megan tried it, she seemed to have bit onto something. Spitting it out, it found to be a ring. No way. Did you have a ring in the cake? Yeah, is that boring? He rested his chin in his hands and asked. Megan smiled sincerely and said, It is a little bit, but I like it. I like whatever you prepared for me. Connor smiled at her and whipped the cream off the ring. Immediately, a shining ring was unveiled. May I have your hand? Megan reached out her hand and Connor helped her put the ring on her fair finger. Then he kissed her hand and said, Happy birthday, honey. Dear listeners, thank you for listening to our show. We understand the impatience of not knowing what happens next in a story, and we do try our best to bring new episodes to you daily. Due to some health issues, our narrator is unable to record at the moment. But so as not to keep you away from the story, we're releasing new episodes with a different narrator. We are determined to bring back your favorite episodes in the original narrator's voice soon. Watch out for more updates. Thank you. It's perfect. After taking a good look at the ring, Megan finally realized how special it was. She had seen a lot of diamonds in different shapes and sizes, from an octagon to a droplet or even the basic shapes. But it was her first time seeing a diamond that took the form of a cloud. Connor had it specially made for Megan. It looked really great on Megan's finger, and it even made her look younger when she wore it. Thank God you like it. Connor wanted to give Megan a special present for her birthday. Something that she could remember forever. He had thought of a lot of things initially and couldn't decide on which was more romantic than the other. In the end, he chose something timeless and expressed his love for it. They had their dinner and they left hand in hand. It wasn't until Megan walked out of the restaurant that she realized the projection was gone. It was freezing outside and Connor helped Megan put on her jacket and scarf. He then put on his own coat and left with Megan. Since they did not drive to the restaurant, they took a stroll on the street. Connor even prepared masks for Megan and himself so that they wouldn't be disturbed. After putting on the masks, they looked like an average couple walking down the busy street. Hey, where are the stars and fireflies? The couple suddenly heard one of the pedestrians ask. They were fake, weren't they? It was really magnificent. How much would it cost to do something like that? As they continued their walk, Megan suddenly felt something cold touch her nose. Hubby, look! It's snowing! Megan exclaimed. Yup. Megan raised her arms up to try and catch the snow. But Connor quickly pulled one of her arms back and shoved it into his pocket. Hey, you'll catch a cold. Even though it sounded as if Connor was scolding her, the only thing Megan could feel was warmth. The snow became heavier and the street was soon covered in white. Walking on such a road with the person you loved the most was the most romantic thing one can experience. They stopped at the city plaza where a lot of street performers were singing despite the cold. One of the speakers was playing Connor's Maybe. Even though it was a romantic song, the singer's scream made it feel like it was a sad song. Oh my, I really want to punch him in the face! Megan couldn't help but get angry at the singer for ruining such a great song. But Connor stopped her and approached the singer. After exchanging a few words with the singer... Connor took the microphone over from him. The singer then replayed the melody and Connor began to sing. As soon as he started, the singer looked at Connor with his mouth wide open. The singer thought he was listening to the original. Connor turned to look at Megan and sang the song that he had written for her. His voice was perfect as he switched between high and low tones. People began to gather around as the plaza was filled with an angelic voice. 
Megan stared affectionately at her husband as he sang. She couldn't help but suspect that Connor must have had his voice blessed by an angel, or else there would be no explanation for his talent. He sang so well that many people placed their money in the young man's hat. Ten dollars, twenty, fifty, a hundred. After he finished the song, the young man's hat was filled with enough money for him to survive the freezing winter. Connor handed the microphone back to the young man, who was already stunned. He watched Connor walk to his pregnant wife and take her away. Thank you, he said to them. There was a moment that he even wanted to ask if he was the famous himself. On their way back, Megan laughed. Now I understand why they say some people sing for a living, while others sing to kill. You helped him make a fortune just now. Well, I meant to sing just for you. What a pity it would be if you never sang again. If you want, I can sing for you every day. Will you also write songs? If you want to sing, I'll write only for you. Great! But I think we should name our babies before we compose any new songs. No worries. I already have them. If they are both boys, let's call them Egan and Corey. For girls, we can call them Michaela and Angelina. If a boy and a girl, we can pick either one from there. Connor considered both the families, and therefore he came up with different surnames for the babies. He looked at his wife for her opinion. Sounds good. You are very considerate. Then, what about their nicknames? I'll leave that to you. I'll make it simple. Let's call them Timmy and Tammy. I wish them happiness every day. I like them. They had prepared enough names for the babies. Now they could enjoy strolling in the snowy night. It was not heavy snow. The following morning, it had already melted. The roads were wet and it felt more like Christmas. Woody and Layla came very early in the morning to pick up Alice so that they could get well prepared for the surgery. The second surgery was the most important and dangerous. Megan had already cried several times secretly. She was so worried about him. But Connor had been acting very relaxed. He did not want his wife and family to be put under great pressure. Before they headed for the hospital, Connor lifted up Alice and looked carefully at her for a long while. He kissed her again and again and was so reluctant to let her go. He wanted to see her as clearly as possible while he was still sober and able to see. Daddy, what's wrong with your eyes? Alice saw that her father's eyes had turned slightly red and something was shining in them. It was some sand. Connor cuddled his daughter again and asked gently, Sweetheart, do you love Daddy? Of course I love you, Daddy. I'll always love you. Alice placed a firm kiss on her father's cheek while saying so. Sweetheart, Daddy loves you too. Daddy loves you so much. Connor felt satisfied. He had just wanted to hear her saying again that she loved him. He had no idea if the surgery would be successful, but he could only wish for the best. Woody and Layla were touched by the interactions between the father and daughter. Leave Alice to us, Woody approached Connor and said. We'll take care of her until your surgery ends. Connor nodded and turned to rub Alice's head. Don't be a naughty kid, okay? Okay, Alice nodded. She then left with Woody, leaving Layla and Megan to accompany Connor. Everything was already prepared at the hospital for Connor's arrival. Some of his friends and family were also there to cheer him up. The doctor in charge of the surgery was a famous specialist, and Rowan was also one of the team members that would be performing the operation. This is my mentor, Rowan introduced the doctor in charge to Connor. He's one of the best in neurosurgery. 
He's also a recipient of the Nobel Prize in Medicine. You have nothing to worry about if he's the one overseeing the operation. Rowan was trying to calm his patient and the family members down. The truth was that the procedure was far more complicated than what the present medical could handle. They could only take a risk and treat the surgery as an experiment. See? They got the best to treat you. You have nothing to worry about, Megan said to Connor. You're right, Connor nodded. Only two hours were left before the operation, and the couple was hugging each other tightly. They stayed like that until the nurse told them it was time. Connor then kneeled down to talk to the babies in Megan's belly. My children, wait for me, okay? And don't bully your mother too much. He then got back up and kissed Megan. Megan, I love you. Always. I love you too. Both of them shed tears as Connor went into the operating room. As soon as Connor disappeared from Megan's side, tears began to roll down her cheeks like waterfalls. She prayed in her heart for her husband's safe recovery. Rowan's mentor began the operation, while the former assisted as much as he could. The surgery required optimal focus as one mistake could ruin everything. Megan, Layla, Susan, and Penny were waiting outside the operating theater. Trevor was there too. Even though he still acted like an idiot, he knew that Lady White Tea would make her move that day. The only thing he had to do was stay near Connor and his family to make sure nothing would happen. One hour passed. Then came a male nurse pushing a trolley. He wore a pair of black rubber-soled boots and a string of beads on his arm. He completely matched the description that Lady Whitey had told him about her assassin. Be careful. The previously ignorant Trevor had become fully vigilant. He shouted and leaped toward that person. Seeing him coming, that person immediately pushed the cart forward. Trevor took him down and beat him hard. When Megan and the rest heard the noise and turned back, they could only see a cart rushing toward them. Ah! Megan was hit on the belly and felt sharp pain. Layla kicked the cart to the side immediately. But they had never expected that the cart was loaded with a bomb. The knocking and kicking made it explode. There was a huge bang and flames. The explosion shook the entire building. People inside the operating room felt it too. The nurses heard the bang. They were scared and wondered what had happened. But the supervisor, Rowan, and the other doctors were never disturbed. It was the most critical moment, and nothing could have distracted them, even if the sky collapsed. Seeing them keeping focused on the operation, the others had to try to stay calm as well. It was a mess in the hallway after the explosion. Penny had been knocked away. Susan and Layla covered Megan so that she was not hurt by the bomb. But the hit to her belly was bad. She started bleeding and her water broke. Megan held her belly in pain and cried, It's painful! So painful! Shit! Are you in labor? Layla cried anxiously. It seems so! We have to get Megan to the labor room! Susan said. She tried to get Megan up, but the woman carrying two babies was too heavy for her. While they were feeling helpless, Trevor put down the attacker and rushed to them. He lifted up Megan and said, You stay here. I'll send her to the labor room. Layla was shocked by Trevor suddenly becoming normal, but she had no time to ask further questions. They had to let Trevor take Megan under such an emergency. Then Layla asked Susan to stay outside the operation room, while she followed Trevor to take care of Megan. Soon enough, the guards of the hospital all came to check it out. The police arrived, too. The attacker was arrested and the mess was taken care of. The operation carried on intensively. Inside the labor room, Trevor took Megan here and she was immediately sent into the labor room. 
Because she had been hit by the cart, Megan suffered tremendously from the labor. The pain was overwhelming, but she had to try her best to give birth to the babies. At the same time that her husband was undergoing a dangerous operation, Megan suffered from the most difficult delivery. Trevor heard her screaming inside the labor room and felt extremely worried, but there was nothing he could do to help. Now he could only stay here and guard Megan. He chose to stay because he was not sure whether Lady White Tea had any further plans. Layla had been staring at Trevor. She was seriously confused. Wasn't he an idiot? How come he's acting normal all of a sudden? Trevor, you were pretending to be sick all this time, weren't you? Layla questioned, suddenly worried that Trevor might try to take Megan and her sons away amid the danger. What are you planning? Trevor looked at Layla and remained quiet for a while. My plan, he suddenly opened his mouth and said, is to protect Megan. Layla was thoroughly surprised as she could see the pure yet resolved look on the face of the person who was once known as the Devil's Reincarnation. She was starting to believe that Trevor might have really had a change of heart, which then could explain how he would risk himself to save Megan today. They waited for nearly two hours until a nurse came out with a baby and asked, Are there any relatives of Megan here? Yes! Trevor shouted before Layla could respond. The nurse thought Trevor was Megan's husband and congratulated him. Congratulations! Your wife has given birth to a pair of twins. They are both boys. This is the older brother. The nurse gave the boy to Trevor. It was Trevor's first time handling such a small child, and he had no idea what to do. He held the boy in his arms as instructed by the nurse. He lowered his head and looked at the boy, a baby that still hadn't opened his eyes and had a head that was almost as big as his fist. Trevor looked at the baby and could not explain what he was feeling at that moment. His heart, which had become numb and couldn't feel anything from before, was warmed through. Even though the boy was Connor's son, Trevor felt as if he was holding his own. Layla also looked at the boy and asked, Where's the other one? Because of special circumstances, the boy suffered cerebral hypoxia when he came out. He's now being placed in the incubator for further observation. What? The news made Layla worried as she was shocked to hear that one of the boys would have to go through such danger. How's the mother? Trevor asked. He was more worried about Megan after learning that the boys were safe for the moment. She's a little weak and is still unconscious, but she'll wake up soon, so please be patient. The nurse left after saying this. Both Trevor and Layla were really worried, but they could only wait patiently outside. Seeing that man holding the baby the whole time felt weird to Layla, and she said, Let me have the baby. Trevor wanted to hold the baby longer, but since Layla requested it, he handed him over. What a beautiful child, Layla exclaimed. Layla had always heard that newborns were ugly, but her niece, Megan's baby, was clean and white. Yup, Trevor nodded in agreement. Trevor also thought that the baby had excellent facial features, even though he was just born. It's so sad that my little brother could not see this moment, Layla sighed. I wonder how the surgery's going. The operation on the central nervous system of his brain carried on for eight hours and finally came to an end. Connor was sent to the ICU for another 72-hour observation. Rowan, his supervisor, and the other doctors and nurses finally came out of the operating room and heard about what had happened. The family and friends, including Megan's parents, her grandfather, and uncle, all came to the hospital. Connor was still in danger and they could only wait. Hearing that Megan had already given birth to the babies, they all went to check on her. Megan had already been sent to the ward and put on a drip and oxygen. 
She was so weak and still in a coma. They came to her room and asked about the babies. The elder baby seemed okay at first, but later on, he was also sent back to the incubator because of choking. Layla told them, Megan gave birth to two boys, but they are both weak and currently being kept in the incubators. Christine burst into tears hearing that her daughter had almost died during the delivery. Healy and we had to pat her constantly and said, Don't cry, honey. She will wake up soon. What happened today? Megan was not expected to give birth so quickly. Megan's grandfather, Richard, asked. Layla had to tell everybody what had happened, and they were all shocked. No one would have expected that a terrorist could sneak into the top military district hospital of California and create such a mess during Connor's operation. But luckily, Trevor got the attacker. Otherwise, if the disguised attacker had gotten the bomb into the operating room, it would have been disastrous. Now they all turned to Trevor but he seemed like an idiot again and sat quietly in the corner. Layla knew that he was faking it, but she said nothing. As long as he was trying to help, she would let him stay. After all, he could protect Megan. Megan woke up after an hour or so. She opened her eyes to see all those familiar faces. The sharp pain reminded her that she was still alive. It felt like being reborn mother Megan I'm here Christine took her hand and looked at her with tears in her eyes Megan looked around and saw her grandfather her uncle and two sisters-in-law then she asked how is Connor's operation Susan told her it's finished how is he was it successful I have to see him Despite her weakness, Megan tried to get up and go to her husband. But Susan and the others stopped her. You stay here. Connor's operation was successful, but he's being kept in the ICU now. You could not see him even if you went there. You just gave birth and are very weak. Take some good rest now. Speaking of the babies, Megan looked around but did not see the babies or hear their cries. She felt worried. Where are my babies? They are in the incubators. Don't worry, you'll see them when they bring them out. Layla did not tell her the truth. Instead, she said, They are both boys. One is 1.9 kilograms, and the other is 1.8 kilograms. They are adorable. Megan could not help bursting into tears. It had been such a difficult delivery and had almost killed her. Really? Woody also brought Alice to visit Megan. After leaving the little girl with her mother, Woody went to visit Connor. Mommy, where are my siblings? Alice asked as she noticed her mother's belly had shrunk. They are sleeping in another room. You have two baby brothers now. Megan said. Really? Two brothers? Yay! Alice cheered. The little girl was happy that she got two baby brothers at once. Can I go see them? Alice asked. Sure. I'm planning to go there too. Megan took Alice together with her and Christine guided them to the baby's room. The two little babies were sleeping soundly. The nurse explained to Megan which one was the older brother and which one was the younger one. Alice realized there were tubes in the baby's noses and asked, What are those things in their noses? Megan saw that and felt very worried. She asked the nurse, What's wrong with them? Why do they need oxygen? The nurse told her about their situations. Then Megan realized that due to the attack and the difficult delivery, the boys had been suffering from hypoxia. To make it worse, her younger son had some heart problems. Megan was heartbroken upon hearing this. She almost died giving birth, yet her sons were sick now. How could she not feel desperate as their mother?
Christine tried to comfort her. Don't worry. They will be fine. They are weak because they are twins. Twins are more likely to suffer from various problems than single babies. When I had you and your brother, you were the younger one and also very weak. We had you in the incubator for over a month before we could take you home. Megan felt somewhat relieved upon hearing her mother's words. They had to stay in the incubators for a little while longer. She could not stay there for too long and had to leave. Mother, I want to see Connor. Megan had not seen her husband for the past two days. Now that she felt much better, she had to go and check on him. Mommy, Grandma, I want to see Daddy, too. Alice missed her father, too. Right, I'll take you to him. Coming to the ICU, Megan saw through the windows her man lying on the bed in a coma. She could no longer hold back her tears. Seeing her father lying in a coma like last time, Alice felt very worried. Mommy... When will Daddy wake up? Will it take a long while? Megan shook her head and said, I have no idea. Don't cry, Megan. You just gave birth. If you cry too much, you will suffer from eye diseases from now on. Christine tried to convince her with her own experience. She had suffered a lot after giving birth to her babies, which resulted in her poor health. Megan wiped her tears and asked anxiously, Mother, they said the operation was successful, but why is he still in a coma? Thinking of the risks and possible sequels of the operation, Megan felt extremely worried. What if he never woke up again, or if he forgot everything like Trevor? Let's wait and see. The doctor said we need to wait for 72 hours. There was nothing they could do now. Getting out of the ICU, Megan went to see Penny. She saw Penny lying on the bed, as well as Trevor, who sat blankly by the corner. He seemed to not be aware of them coming in. Hearing that she had been hurt in the explosion, Megan asked, Mother, how are you feeling now? Alice was worried too. Grandma, are you okay? Penny patted her on the head and said, Grandma is fine. Then she turned to Megan. Megan, I was about to go see you. Are you feeling better? How are the babies? Penny was actually planning to visit Megan before they arrived. We are fine. No worries, Mother, Megan said. Good, good. She cared more about Megan than herself now. You'd better go and get some good rest. You just had a difficult delivery. Do take good care of yourself. She turned to speak to Christine. Christine, you take her back and take good care of her. I'll come visit you when I'm feeling better. Christine agreed and was about to leave. Then Alice saw Trevor in the corner and ran to him, calling, Uncle Dragonbeard! Trevor was not reacting to anyone until the girl came to him. He put on a smile. Alice, let's go. We'll visit them next time, Megan said. Bye-bye, Uncle Dragonbeard. I'll come again, okay? Alice said and ran to her mother. After they had left, Penny laid down and sighed. What did they do to deserve this? Why can't they live a safe and happy life? If I could trade my life for their happiness, I would do it. Trevor looked out the window. He suddenly made a choice. He decided that it was time to take responsibility. Megan and her family would never be safe unless Lady White Tea was apprehended. After making sure that he wanted to walk down that road, Trevor stood up. The out-of-mind look that he always had was gone and was replaced with a stern look. Mom, please get some rest. I have to go out for a while, Trevor said. Okay, Penny nodded. 
only realizing what was happening when Trevor was at the door. What? Trevor? Penny could not believe that her son, who had lost his mind, was talking to her and even calling her mom. It meant that Trevor had recovered. But no matter how Penny tried to stop her son, Trevor left without turning his head back. He went to Connor's room, and to his luck, Woody and Xavier were outside the door. Woody was the first to notice Trevor walking towards them. He quickly realized Trevor was walking with his head held high. Trevor stopped in front of them. Woody looked at him from top to bottom. To his surprise, Trevor did not look stupid at all. Trevor, were you acting all this time? Woody quickly rested his hand on his gun, preparing for a battle. Now's not the time for that, Trevor said. Mr. Wood, Mr. Xavier, I have something to discuss with the both of you. May I? Both Woody and Xavier were shocked that Trevor could speak like a normal person. What do you want? Trevor looked at Connor's room and said, Do you want to catch who's behind the attack? I might have something to help with that. Woody and Xavier both looked at each other. Even though there might be a chance that Trevor might be setting up a trap, there was no way they could give up on a lead. They brought Trevor to the lounge so they could speak more freely. What were you going to tell us? Woody asked. I do know who's responsible for the attack. Her name is Lady White Tea, Trevor said. Lady White Tea? Woody had seen Megan's movie, Landscape and knew that Lady White Tea was also the person responsible for separating Megan's parents. She wants revenge. Trevor explained to them everything that had happened up until then. Oh my God, are you telling me she's back? Woody could not believe that after all these years, Lady White Tea was still playing with the devil. She should still be in California now. Since Trevor could help them find her, Xavier decided instantly, the sooner the better. Let's go get her. He turned to Woody. Woody, you stay here. I'll go with them. Yes, sure. Then Xavier took Trevor with him and got out of the hospital. He called his men to go with him after Lady White Tea. Trevor directed them to a house on the outskirts. They surrounded the place and broke in. Unfortunately, they were too late. The house was empty. No one's here! Xavier searched the house but found no one. He turned to Trevor suspiciously and pointed his gun at him. Give me an explanation! He wondered if Trevor was sincerely helping or if he had taken them here deliberately. What did he want? They just left. Trevor knew that it was hard to gain their trust because of what he had done in the past. You'd better not hide anything from me, otherwise my bullets are blind. Why would I lie to you? If I did not want to help, why would I risk my own life to bring you here? In order to prove that he was loyal, Trevor pointed at the cup on the table and said, You see? The tea is still warm. They must have just left. We were one step late. The fruit tea on the table was indeed still hot. Xavier decided to believe him for now. So can you get in touch with her again, or do you know where they might go? Since they were already cautious and went on the run, it would be very difficult to get them now. Trevor shook his head. No. She came to me every time with different numbers. I could not reach her. They had to admit that being a former spy, Lady White Tea was really good at counter-reconnaissance. It would not be easy to get her. And to make things worse, they were cautious now. Xavier called his men back and took Trevor back to the hospital. He sent him to Penny's room and arranged a few guards to watch him. I have to have an eye on you. You should understand that we could arrest you at any time given your special situation. Trevor was a normal person now. 
which meant that he could be taken for an international trial for his former crimes. Trevor nodded. Yes, I know. When you get Lady White Tea, I will surrender myself. Xavier sensed that he was confessing sincerely rather than lying, so he agreed. If Lady White Tea ever contacts you again, you should report to us immediately. No problem. Xavier left and Trevor got into the ward. Seeing him coming back, Henny was relieved. She kept staring at him and asked, Trevor, are you fully recovered? Trevor came to her and got hold of her hand. Yes, mother, I'm fine now. That is great. This is great. I finally heard you call me mother. I'm so happy. Penny burst into tears. But recalling what her elder son had said earlier on, she became worried again. Since you are fine now, will they come to arrest you? What should we do? Don't worry, Mom. I have nothing to say. Even if they want to catch me, I have to take my responsibility for what I've done if I want to live up to the name, Trevor said. But I won't be able to see you easily if you get caught. Why don't you leave right away? I won't tell anyone. Penny cried, not wanting her son to go to jail. No, I can't leave, Trevor said. Don't worry too much about it. I can still be with you for a while. My mission now is to protect you, Megan, and... and Big Bro. I could not live with myself if any of you were hurt. Trevor. Penny hugged her son as Trevor patted her back. All right, I get it, Penny said after she stopped crying. Can you take me to where your nephews are? I want to see them. Okay. Trevor helped Penny to her wheelchair and pushed her out of the room. Xavier's subordinates asked her where they were going. After learning that they were heading to Megan's room, the guards followed them. Megan was talking with Harris, who had just returned from overseas, and their parents. They turned their heads when they heard Trevor and Penny coming in. Mother, are you okay? Megan asked. Yes, I came to see you and the babies. Penny smiled. Good afternoon, Auntie Penny, Harris greeted with a smile. Good afternoon, Mr. President, Penny greeted back. I didn't interrupt the conversation, did I? No, not at all. Megan, can I have a look at the babies? Sure, let my mom take you there. Christine took over the wheelchair's handle from Trevor and said, Come on. Harris got up and followed them too. I want to take a look at the babies too, he said. Trevor kept quiet the whole time, and everyone still thought that his mind was that of a kid and paid no attention to him. Only Megan and Trevor were in the room. Megan looked at Trevor and turned around, deciding that there was no need to talk with someone who couldn't understand her. How are you, Megan? Megan quickly turned her head back when she heard Trevor open his mouth. Trevor was looking at her, and the kid-like face he'd had before was gone. Trevor! Megan shouted as she sat up. Don't be scared. I'm just here to see you, Trevor said as he walked towards her. Don't come any closer. You weren't stupid from the beginning, were you? It's all an act, Megan scolded as she backed up to the wall. Megan did suspect that Trevor was acting at the beginning, but everything about him being stupid seemed so real, and she had changed her mind. He finally revealed himself when no other people were around them. There was no way Megan would not be scared. She was worried that he had something planned, something that would shake the whole world again. All Megan knew was that it was a mistake to put a Satan-like figure by their side. I'm sorry. I know I did a lot of terrible things in the past, and you have every reason to detest me and be afraid of me. But what I'm trying to say is, please do not be scared. I won't hurt you or anyone else. I have been playing stupid just to atone for my sins. When I get Lady White Tea, I will surrender myself to the police and go for the international trial. 
But before that, please, allow me to stay here and protect you. Megan found herself speechless. How should she react to a devil's confession? Megan almost felt that it was an illusion. She never would have expected that Trevor would share his innermost thoughts with her. Recalling what they had gone through lately, if he was merely playing a fool, he should have had enough chances to take their lives. Yet he never did so. He was willing to be Alice's horse and crawled on the floor. He saved Alice when she was almost hit. What he had done was completely different from the past. Perhaps he was sincerely atoning for his sins. Megan would rather believe him now. Speaking of catching Lady White Tea, Megan asked further, Do you have any idea who Lady White Tea is? Yes, she is Renee. I used to call her aunt, Trevor answered. He was right. Being Raven's sister and Amelia's aunt, of course Renee used to be his aunt too, but not any longer. If you catch her, please do help me ask where she took my brother many years ago. Your brother? Yes, I have a twin brother, but he was taken away by Renee right after he was born. We haven't found him so far. I hope we can get some clues from Renee. Even Trevor had no idea about this. Sure, I'll help you find it out. Thank you for sending me to the labor room the other day. Megan was sincerely grateful. Don't mention it. And it was also you who got shot for me in the amusement park in that squirrel costume, right? Megan had been wondering about this for a while. Now she asked him again. Trevor said nothing, but it was a tacit understanding. Megan thought it through and finally figured it out. You were injured, so the blood on Alice's dress that day did not come from your finger, but your bullet wound, correct? Trevor nodded. Megan was right, so she made a bolder guess. In that case, the one who warned me about Jace's assassination and President Jones about the bomb in his flight was also you, right? Trevor stared at her calmly without saying a word, but Megan already had the answer. How unexpected. He had done so many things secretly for them. If it was not for his help behind the scenes, the situation would have gone a lot worse. Jace, Harris, Connor, herself, and even their daughter, they would have all been dead by now. After realizing what had happened, Megan said to him again, Thank you, Trevor. There is no need. I want to protect you and be useful. They talked a bit more after that. Megan was filled with surprise and gratitude. She had never expected that she would ever have such a heartfelt conversation with Trevor. And she chose to believe that he was no longer a devil, but rather an angel redeemed. She hoped that he would stay that way from now on, and that he could get Lady White Tea the soonest. After struggling for 72 hours, Connor was finally out of the danger zone. He finally woke up five days after the surgery. He did not feel anything strange with his body other than the slight pain in his head. He did not lose his memory, and it was a huge relief. Megan went to visit him the moment she got word that Connor had woken up. Connor grabbed his wife's hand when they finally met. I made it, Connor said. I knew you could make it, Megan said as tears rolled down her face. Connor suddenly realized that Megan's belly wasn't huge anymore. Your belly, where are the babies? Connor asked with a panicked voice. You have been unconscious the whole time, so it's normal that you don't know, Layla replied to the question. Your wife has successfully given birth to two babies. What? When? Five days ago. 
disappointment could clearly be seen on Connor's face. He had promised to be with Megan until labor, and yet he'd missed it utterly. They didn't tell Connor about the accident that happened during his surgery, or that Megan was forced to go into labor early. I'm so sorry. I promised you that I'd be there for you all the time, but you had to suffer all of that alone again. Don't fret too much about it, Megan comforted. What's important is that you're well and alive. Yes. The couple looked at each other as they held hands. The other people left the room to give them some private time. Come here, Connor said as he moved to the side, emptying up space on his bed. Lie with me. Okay. Megan climbed up on his bed and lay on his shoulder. It must have been painful, right? No, not at all. Everything went smoothly. Megan did not want to worry her husband and decided to hide the truth from him. How are they? They're doing great. Megan raised her head and said, Aren't you going to ask me if they are boys or girls? Are they boys or girls? Yes. One boy and one girl. Yes, again. Two girls? Two boys? Yep, you have two sons now. Congratulations on becoming the father of three kids, Megan smiled. Thank you, you've worked really hard. Connor hugged his wife tightly and kissed her. Even though Megan had said she didn't suffer much, Connor knew that giving birth was not an easy feat. Didn't I book the best maternity hotel for you? Why didn't you go there? Connor asked, since it had been five days since the labor. I canceled it, Megan replied. I decided to stay here with you so that we can leave the hospital together as a family. But is this enough for you? Don't worry about me. My mom's here too. I will be restless if I'm not by your side. Okay, then let's go home together later. Connor was awake. But after the operation on his brain, he would need a long while to fully recover and would have to stay in the hospital for further observation and treatment. He could not yet get out of the bed, not to mention the hospital. Megan was supposed to be in a luxury maternity hotel now, but she chose to stay in the hospital for Connor. She stayed in a sweet style ward. There was a kitchen, a bathroom, and everything else she needed. Christine stayed to take good care of her and cook for her. Megan recovered fairly soon. She was fully able to breastfeed her boys. She used the breast pump, and the nurses took it to the babies every day. The babies were getting better, too. Nurses told them that they might be able to leave the incubators in a few days. Megan was very much looking forward to welcoming her babies back. She checked on them every day and took many cute photos for her husband. Connor was also very excited to see their photos. He could barely let go of the phone. Megan asked, Who do you think they resemble? Of course I do. They'll definitely become handsome boys soon enough. Megan gurgled and said, How come I never knew you were a narcissist? One has to look good in order to be a narcissist. Don't you like my pretty face? I do. I couldn't love it more. Megan cuddled him and pressed her face on his chest. Then she asked, How about you? Did you fall in love with me because I was pretty? No. To be precise, it was you who came to conquer me first. Then I had a crush. If it was not her who had seduced him at first, he would have never surrendered so easily. So, tell me, do you like my face or my figure? I like both. Megan seemed annoyed. What if I grew old or got disfigured or became fat? Would you still love me the same? Perhaps it was the fat on her loosened belly after giving birth that made her worry. No matter what you look like, you are always the love of my life. I love you. 
not for your pretty face or your charming figure, but your very self and your soul. You got it? After saying so, Connor placed a long kiss on her lips. His answer, as well as the kiss, was very satisfying. Megan was fully relieved now. While they were caressing endlessly, a little girl called from outside the room. Wow! Daddy! Mommy! Suddenly, hearing their daughter calling, Megan bounced back and turned. Sweetheart, come over here! Alice ran cheerfully toward them and bent over the bed. She asked, What were you doing just now? Nothing. Mommy was showing Daddy your brother's photos. I want to see them too. Sure, here you go. Megan showed her daughter the photos on her phone. Alice found the two babies in the photos to be identical. She was confused. Mommy... Which one is my first brother and which one is second? This is your first brother and this is your second brother. What are their names? Alice could not keep calling them first and second brother. Well, their nicknames are Timmy and Tammy. Timmy? Tammy? Alice found those names not to be distinctive at all. Alice felt that her baby brothers weren't good enough, and they weren't in the same category as hers. Mommy, the names aren't good. Can we change them? Alice asked. Huh? Do you have any ideas? Alice tilted her head and began to think. I got it. Why don't we give them names with fruits? Then we can be a family of fruits. Not a bad idea. Which fruits, then? I know. Big Brother will be Little Apple, and Younger Brother will be Little Grape. Apple, Grape, and Cherry. Sure thing, Connor laughed. Looks like we won't have to worry about not having fruits in our house in the future. Then it's decided, Megan laughed, too. Yippee! Alice jumped with joy. Little apple, little grape, can you hear me? Hurry up and reply or I'll eat you all. The adults laughed at Alice's action once again. While Megan and Connor stayed at the hospital, it had completely become their second home as friends and family would visit them from time to time. Harvey and his family came to California again for Jenna's third session with Richard. They visited Connor first, before visiting Megan. When Alice met Patrick, she pulled his hands happily. Brother Patrick, did you know? I have two new brothers now. Really? Where are they? Come with me. Alice would always go to visit her baby brothers in the hospital. She informed Megan and took Patrick to them. Alice looked for her brothers in the nursery. She pointed at them when she found them. Look, this is my brother. The other one is my brother, too. Oh, my God, they're so small. Patrick expressed his surprise. Of course. They are babies, after all. Do they have names? Yup. The big brother is Little Apple, and the younger one is Little Grape. That's some yummy names. Patrick laughed as he pictured a huge red apple and a bunch of grapes. Yup, apples and grapes are tasty. Patrick looked at the babies and suddenly said, Cherry, let's have babies once we get married, okay? Okay, we'll have a lot of babies and buy them a lot of milk. Yes, I'll earn a lot of money so that we can live a happy life. Yay! The kids weren't even 15 years old if they added their ages up, and yet they were already talking about their married life. The nurses could not help but laugh when they heard the kids' conversation. One day after the Hannibal family's visit, Adam and Samantha also flew to California to see Megan. It had been a long while. Adam seemed more charming and responsible as a mature man. 
He carried some gifts and held Samantha's hand, moving toward the room. Samantha could only get rid of him at the door. She had wanted to come by herself, but Adam managed to find out her plan and flew on the same flight with her to California. She tried to kick him away, but he insisted that he was visiting Megan and happened to be on the same flight with her. What else could she do? Entering the room, Samantha smiled at Megan and said, Yan Yan, congrats! I heard you had two baby boys. I'm so happy for you. Samantha passed the bouquet to Megan, who smiled back and thanked her. Thank you, Sister Samantha and Brother Adam, for coming all the way here. Of course, we had to come. Adam put the gifts on the table and came to sit by Samantha. Seeing them staying pretty close, Megan asked, Are you guys getting married soon? Do send me an invitation. Adam nodded. Sure, sure. I'll definitely let you know. Samantha gave him a mean look and thought, Who is getting married to you? We've got a lot to figure out before that, okay? Adam deliberately ignored her look and was not annoyed at all. He would never give up, no matter how she reacted. They chatted for a while and talked about Caroline. Sister Samantha, do you know how Caroline has been doing recently? Is she still staying with you? No, she moved out. Samantha knew that Caroline was running away from her ex. She tried to persuade her to go back to him for the baby's sake. But Caroline was determined never to get back to Harris. There was nothing she could do. I'm so worried. She's pregnant. Who could take care of her if she's in need? Megan sighed. She'd just had a difficult delivery and knew exactly how crucial her family was for her. How could Caroline do it by herself? Don't be too worried. I saw a man helping her move out recently. He was nice and gentle. Perhaps he could be her new boyfriend. Seriously? I was just thinking aloud. I have no idea either. Megan felt even more worried. If Caroline had found a new boyfriend, what about her brother? Samantha did not stay for long. She had too many things to take care of and had to fly back on the following day. Adam had originally planned to take her on a vacation in California. They could barely have any intimate time in New York, but she would not spare him the chance. With Samantha gone, there was no point for him to stay further. So he followed her back. It had been half a month. Megan and Hu Yunshen had visitors almost every day. Woody picked Alice up from the school and took her to the hospital. Penny had fully recovered, and Trevor brought her to see Megan and the babies. Seeing her grandmother and Uncle Dragonbeard, Alice greeted them cheerfully and put her school bag down. The first thing she would like to do was, Mommy, Grandma, I want to see my brothers. Sure, let's go together. Penny had already chatted with Megan for a while, so she asked Trevor to take her to her grandchildren as well. Trevor pushed Penny to the nursery, and Woody and Alice followed behind them. As they were walking, a nurse with a mask walked towards them. In his hands were two huge black plastic bags. It looked like trash. They thought the nurse was taking out the trash and made way for him. When they reached the nursery, they found that all the nurses were resting their heads on the table. Woody checked the time and it was only evening. He wondered what gave the nurses the nerve to sleep during work. He knocked on the table trying to wake them up, but none of them gave him a response. Realizing that something was wrong, Woody put his finger under the nose of one of the nurses and realized she was not breathing. What the? They're all dead! Woody shouted. He quickly kicked the door to the nursery open and rushed in, also realizing something was going on. Trevor left Alice with Penny and ran in after Woody. When they checked the nursery, they realized the two babies who had been sleeping quietly in their incubators were gone. Shit! Someone took the babies! Woody panicked. He couldn't believe that someone would dare to steal the babies in the heavily surveilled hospital. Trevor calmed down and began to think. 
He suddenly realized that the nurse with two bags in his hands might have been one of Lady White Tea's men who was tasked to steal the babies. I got it. The nurse with the plastic bags we ran into just now. He took the babies, Trevor said. He quickly rushed out from the nursery with Woody behind him. As soon as he went through the main door, they saw the nurse had already gotten on another person's motorbike that was waiting for him. There he is! They're getting away! Trevor quickly chased after them. Woody looked around and saw a courier next to them. He took out all his money and gave it to the courier to borrow his bike. Trevor did his best chasing after the culprits, but his prosthetic leg was dragging him down. Just as he was thinking of stopping a car to help him, Woody stopped right next to him. Get on, Woody shouted. Trevor sat behind Woody, and they chased after the bike that was already pulling away. The culprits finally realized they were being chased, and drifted off the main road and into the mountains. They ditched their bike and ran into the forest. Woody and Trevor continued to pursue them until they reached the end of a canyon. There's nowhere to run now! Woody shouted. They were still skeptical about whether the babies were in the bags. But when they heard babies crying, they were sure of it. Hand the babies over and I'll let you live, Woody said as he pointed his gun toward the kidnappers. The two men were planning to hide in the mountain for a while and go to their master later on. But they were already cornered by Woody and Trevor. If they were to go one step further they would definitely fall over the cliff and die. Yet they still wanted to try their luck. So upon taking a brief look at each other, one of them suddenly threw a bag toward Woody and Trevor. Woody leaped over to get the bag regardless of the danger. Upon getting a hold of the bag, he felt the tender baby inside, who was crying violently. When opening the bag, he confirmed from the name tag that it was Megan's second boy, Little Great. The two were about to flee when Trevor blocked their way and claimed, Surrender the other child, otherwise you are dead! They were so desperate to survive, so the disguised nurse decided to give up on the child and replied, Here you go, catch it! However, he faked a throw to Trevor but actually swung the bag toward the cliff. No! Seeing him throw the baby over the cliff, Trevor was tingled and leaped immediately toward the cliff despite the danger. Luckily, he was quick enough to catch the baby. However, when he got hold of the baby, he realized that he was already off the cliff and could not help from falling. Ah! Trevor's voice resounded among the cliffs. Trevor! Woody witnessed what had happened. Trevor did catch the baby, but they fell over the cliff together. The two wreckers were about to flee when Woody saw them. Bang! 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 You go to hell! Woody shot them dead at once. Then he ran to the cliff and looked downward, but he saw nothing except for a foggy abyss. The canyon in the mountain was called the Death Canyon by the people in California. It was said to be connected with an undercurrent that led to the Black Sea and the Sea of Seoul. Due to its violent turbulence, no one had survived falling into it. Woody felt like he was burning inside. What should he do now? He only got Little Grape back. But Little Apple had fallen over the cliff together with Trevor. What could he tell Megan and his boss? Inside the hospital... Penny and Alice did not find the babies, so they rushed back to the ward. Mommy! Mommy! Oh no! Alice ran as fast as she could back to the ward and cried, What happened? Megan sat up upon hearing her daughter calling. Christine also came out of the kitchen and asked, What's wrong, Cherry? My brothers are gone! They're gone! Alice seemed extremely anxious. Penny also returned to the ward and said, Megan, Kristen, this is terrible. The babies are gone. Megan thought that they were making a fuss and tried to calm her down. Mother, don't worry. Perhaps the nurse took them for a bath. No, the nurses are all dead. Someone must have taken the babies. What? 
Penny's words seemed like a bolt in the blue for Megan. She burst into tears and cried, What happened? How could my babies have been taken away? I have to go find them! No one could believe what they heard. With Christine accompanying her, Megan went to the nursery. Police had already arrived and the nursery's door was crowded with people. Three nurses had died from being attacked. One hand online Where are my babies? Megan shouted as she pushed her way into the nursery. It was all real. Download today. As she could started. not find little apple and little grape. My sons! Megan collapsed to the floor and cried. Christine also could not hold it in any longer and tears rolled down her face. No, this isn't happening. I have to go look for them. Megan climbed up, realizing that crying wouldn't solve the problem, and was about to go find her children. Christine stopped her just in time. Megan, stop. Woody and Marcus are going after them. We have to put our belief in them. Don't hurt yourself. But my sons... Megan finally fainted from all the shock. Christine quickly got someone to help Megan back to her room. When Xavier learned from his sister that his nephews were taken, he rushed to the hospital to help. The police had locked the whole hospital down and begun their investigation. Christine only told the news of the incident to Henry and Harris. She chose not to tell Connor, as they were worried that he could not handle the shock since he was still recovering from brain surgery. They waited impatiently for Woody to return with good news. He brought one of the babies back to Megan. Where's the other one? Both Christine and Penny asked. I could only get one back. Woody did not tell them the whole story yet. What should we do? Christine took the child from Woody and realized the baby was shivering from the cold. Oh, my poor thing. Thing. Since the incident took place in the nursery, they chose to keep the baby by their side. Christine found a clean towel to wrap around the baby. She hugged the baby until the shivering stopped. Where's Trevor? Penny asked as she noticed Trevor was not with Woody. Why isn't he back yet? He... Woody tried to explain. But before he could, Megan was woken up by the cries of her son. I have to look at them, Megan said in pain. Look, he's here. Christine quickly showed Megan little great. My son. Megan hugged her son and kissed him. It was her first time hugging him. Megan sensed something wrong after holding her baby for a while. Second brother, where is my other baby? Woody's eyes were blood red. He felt like something was sticking in his throat and keeping him from uttering a word. Say something, please! You're driving me crazy! Megan kept asking, and Woody had to tell the truth. Megan, you have to prepare yourself for this. Trevor and I followed the two guys to the canyon in Mang Mountain. We managed to save this baby. But the other one... Woody tried hard to control himself so that he could finish the sentence. The other one was thrown off the cliff. Trevor did catch your baby, but they fell off together. Upon saying so, Woody covered his eyes with his hands. It was overwhelming for him to mention it. Everyone was shocked. Hearing that her son and grandson had fallen over the cliff... Penny could not stop wailing. Megan was petrified. When she came back to herself, her tears fell like rain. How could this have happened? Why? She could not believe a word. Could her baby have fallen over the cliff together with Trevor? No! Megan screamed and put Little Grape down. She grabbed Woody by the collar and asked, You're kidding! He must be fine! Second brother! You are kidding, aren't you? No matter how hard she shook Woody, he did not say anything further. We have to get Little Apple back! He will be fine!
They must be hiding somewhere. Megan let go of Woody and headed to search for the baby. But Woody stopped her right away. Megan, wake up. The baby is gone. You have to stay strong. Think about little great. He's already lost his brother. He could not afford to lose his mother. My boy! Megan cried and passed out in Woody's arms. The room was enveloped by grief. Little Alice also realized what had happened and began to sob. She'd lost one brother. Her mother and two grandmothers were in grief. She felt extremely sad, too, because she would never see her little brother again. They had to keep it from Connor for the time being. Xavier took his men from JS First Squadron to the canyon in search of the baby and Trevor. Henry and Harris also sent out their men immediately to join the search. They took two different paths. One group went down from the cliff, while the other searched upstream from the Black Sea, following the undercurrent. They were hoping for the best. Or, at least, they had to find their bodies. Christmas is over. Connor did not see his wife coming today. He felt worried and asked Layla, How is Megan? Layla was aware of the tragedy, but she had to pretend to be calm in front of Connor. In order for him to recover soon, they chose not to tell him now. They're doing great. I have to see her and the babies. For some reason, Connor felt very restless today. He could not breathe properly and was worried that something bad was happening. You stay here. You cannot go anywhere now. If you hurt yourself again, Megan will definitely be freaked out. Layla urged her brother to stay in bed. Connor wanted to recover as soon as possible, so he could only remain in his room. But he was also worried about Megan and his sons. Megan was feeding breast milk to Little Grape. As she looked at Little Grape, who was doing his best to drink the milk, she couldn't help but think of Little Apple. Tears from Megan began to drip onto Little Grape. She couldn't even imagine herself living if Little Grape wasn't there with her. Megan, don't put any more stress on your body, Christine said as she wiped the tears off her daughter's face. Megan had not visited Connor for a few days since her eyes were still swelling from all the crying. They had decided to hide the incident from Connor for as long as they could. Henry and Harris came to visit Megan at the hospital. They knew that they had to take responsibility for what had happened. It's my fault, Harris said. I should have put some protection on the babies. No, I should have killed that wretched woman from the beginning. Henry scolded when he learned that Renee was responsible for stealing the baby. Dad, big bro, it's not your fault. Even if we kill her right now, we still couldn't get little Apple back. Megan sobbed. We've already dispatched a team to look for them. There's still hope that we actually find him. But even if there was hope, it was slim. If little Apple had survived the fall... He would have still died from starvation or the cold. The rescue team worked day and night, despite the danger. Two days had passed since then, and there still wasn't any good news. Connor was waiting impatiently in his room, wanting to see his wife and sons. Layla tried to hold him back, and just as she was about to fail, Megan came to visit him with little grape. Megan! Connor let out a sigh of relief after seeing his wife and son. Didn't I tell you to rest? Why are you up again? Megan scolded. Connor's head was still covered in bandages, and the wound on his head wasn't fully healed yet. He should have restricted his movements as much as possible. I was worried about you and the kids, Connor smiled. Is that him? Connor took Little Grape over from Megan and hugged him softly. A surge of warmth rushed through Connor's body the moment he saw Little Grape. It was a feeling that he could not even describe. Little Grape, do you know who I am? 
I'm your daddy. Connor smiled as he talked to the baby. His eyebrows are just like yours, Connor said and raised his head, only to see Megan crying. What's wrong? Why are you crying? I'm so happy because Little Grape is getting better. When Megan said so, she was actually crying her heart out silently. Layla knew how hard it was and came to wrap her arms around her shoulders. I'm so happy too. Now we are relieved. When we can leave the hospital, they will both be fine. Connor reached to get a hold of Megan and pulled her to his side. They looked at the cute little grape with completely different moods. When Connor was able to leave the hospital, they would have to tell him the truth. How could he handle this by then? It had been seven days since they were gone. The search was in vain. It was impossible for them to survive beyond the seven days. They might have been eaten by the fish deep down in the Black Sea or the Sea of Soul. They had to face the truth, no matter how tragic it was. The person who was accountable for this was Lady White Tea, namely Renee. Harris had already offered a reward of $8 million in order to arrest his own mother, Renee. With what she had done, no one would accuse him of being ruthless in order to arrest his own mother. Because Renee had gone too far, almost everyone hated her now. After a month, Megan and Connor were both ready to leave the hospital. He got prepared very early in the morning and came to pick up his wife and sons, accompanied by Layla and Woody. Megan had packed up her things and was waiting for him with her mother. She had already buried her grief deep down and forced herself to stand strong. She still had a baby to raise. There was no time for her to grieve. Her husband was coming soon. They could no longer hide it from him. Connor came and greeted. Mother, Megan, are you ready? Yes, we've packed. Megan pointed at the luggage by her side. Woody and Layla helped her take those to the car. Christine followed them out and said, Megan, I'll wait for you downstairs. There were only a couple and a little baby left in the room. Let me hold him. Connor took the baby from his wife. Then he looked around and asked, Where is his brother? Megan blinked with tears in her eyes and tried to speak as calmly as she could. Connor, I have to tell you something. Our little apple is gone. What? Our boy is gone. He's dead. Despite her intention to stay strong, she could no longer hold back her sorrow and grief. She covered her face and burst into tears again. Connor was startled. It was too hard for him to swallow. Shouldn't the baby be fine? They said that Little Apple was stronger than Little Grape. How could he have died? Tell me, what happened? Connor placed the baby on the bed and cuddled his wife. It was Lady White Tea. She took away our babies. Megan told him the truth while weeping. Connor could not believe what had happened while he was hospitalized. The baby was stolen by Lady White Tea and fell off the cliff together with Trevor. Oh my. Upon hearing the truth, Connor was petrified for quite a while. When he finally came back to himself, he could feel nothing but roaring rage and profound grief. The news was indeed a massive shock to Connor, as he could feel his head ripping apart. It hurt so much that he hugged his head tightly. Hubby, are you okay? Megan asked, realizing Connor was in pain. You have to calm down. I held the incident back from you because I was worried that something like this would happen. Please... Stay strong. Megan, 
I'm sorry. Connor blamed himself. He blamed himself for having something wrong with his body when his family needed him the most. He knew that he could have protected his family instead of lying on the bed. Connor was in pain from the sadness, the anger, and the self-blame. But he was also in pain when he thought of the hardship that his wife had to go through for the past few days. The couple hugged each other for a long time. Did someone go look for him? Connor asked. Dad, Big Bro, and Uncle are looking for him, but they still can't find him. Connor, we have to accept the truth. We only have one son left. They should have returned to the manor happily, but now the manor was shrouded in sadness. The party for the babies was also canceled. The room that had been prepared for the twins, where everything came in pairs, all became Little Grape's sole belongings. Why don't we remove the other half? Connor asked worried that his wife might be in pain when she saw the things that were supposed to belong to Little Apple. No, keep them. What if Little Apple comes back one day? Megan could even understand why she would hope for something nearly impossible. She really hoped that Little Apple was still alive, that he would return someday in the future. Connor sighed and got prepared to leave for the mountain. Both Christine and Henry were also living in the manor to take care of the newborn. The couple left Little Grape with Megan's parents and went to the mountain. Woody was the only witness, having seen everything with his own eyes. Connor asked Woody to go with them, and Layla also followed them to accompany Megan. They arrived at the windy and chilly canyon. Connor helped his wife put on a fleece jacket and a scarf to protect her. They walked towards the edge of the canyon and looked below, but all they could see was fog and infinite depths. Little Apple! Mommy's here! Megan shouted, hoping that she would get a reply. Tears began to fall again as Connor hugged his wife. They should have been a family of five, and now... Little Apple was gone. The chances of him being alive after falling into the canyon with Trevor was very slim. If they were, they should have been found by now. I really want to go down and look for him. Megan hated herself for not having a pair of wings or the ability to walk on walls. If she had either one of them, she could have gone down to look for her son. The current is too swift down there. It leads to the Black Sea and Sea of Soul. We cannot get down there from here. Connor tried hard to control himself while comforting his wife. Harris already sent a submarine team to search from the mouth of the Black Sea to the upstream portion of the river. But they found nothing so far. Megan, perhaps we should not cling to false hope any longer. It's time to face the truth. Little Apple will never come back. We can only wish him to be free from sorrow and pain in heaven. If there is a next life, I hope he will be born into a normal family and lead a normal life. Connor covered his eyes upon finishing these words. It was indeed heartbreaking to lose their baby. Honey! Megan wailed in Connor's arms. Poor little Apple. Mommy and Daddy will never see you again. Seeing them crying in each other's arms by the cliff, Woody and Layla could not hold back their tears either. The loss would probably be haunting them for a long while. Some pains were inconsolable. Coming out of the canyon, Megan promised her husband that she would stay strong for him and their children. What else could she do? Life had to carry on. When they came home, her mother had already prepared the dinner and invited Penny over. Penny was also suffering from the loss of her younger son. She and Megan were both in the most profound grief. 
and they could understand each other the most. Perhaps because Megan had been so heartbroken, she could no longer breastfeed her baby since they'd left the hospital. She tried various stimulators in vain. Her grandfather Richard checked on her and said it was due to the inconsolable the rare sound of silence filled the air for just a moment as the eastern horizon brightened over busy New York City. Emma Turner rubbed her stiff neck as she stood in front of an apartment building in the area stimulators in vain. Her grandfather Richard checked on her and said it was due to the inconsolable pain of losing her baby. Once the lactation was suppressed, it would be extremely hard for it to come back again. The poor little grape was starving and crying without breastfeeding. Connor tried to feed him with baby formula, but the determined little grape would rather starve himself than take that bottled formula. Out of desperation, the couple had to hire a wet nurse at a high salary to breastfeed little grape every day. The wet nurse was called Tina, a 26-year-old. She was from New York and had just given birth to a baby not long ago. Her husband had been injured in construction work, so she had to take on the burden of providing for the family. Connor and Megan had an interview with her and found this young mother to be a reliable person. This fair woman was very healthy and well-educated, so they decided to hire her. They paid her $30,000 per month so that she could balance between taking good care of her own family and feeding Little Grape. Little Grape was back to breastfeeding and grew up healthier and stronger. Megan was taken good care of by her family and was also recovering quickly. Although her physical health did recover, her broken heart was no longer repairable. Time flew. Little Grape was two months old now. The handsome little boy was a comfort to everyone. Megan spent all her time and energy on raising little Grape. She had already finished one sweater, but failed to continue halfway through the second one. That's it for today, guys. Do you want to inspire me more? You can buy me a puppy. Thank you for listening.